everyone. Um, welcome to Designing for Tribal Sovereign Nations in the United States with Sadie Redwing as a part of our second annual Midwest Design Week. Um, my name is Ashton Spann and I'm one of the co-vice presidents uh, for AIJ Cincinnati, um, one of the 70 plus chapters of AIJ, the Professional Association for Design. Um, this week we've had a lot of really great presenters um, that have been focused around the theme um, of access to design. This event would not have been possible without the help of our sponsors. Um, thank you so much to Sachi and Sachi X, the University of Arkansas Graphic Design Program, Creatives on Call, Salesforce, um, Deckel and Money Penny, and the rest of our amazing sponsors. Um, we are grateful for your support and honored that you uh, have entrusted us to fulfill our goals for Midwest Design Week in a meaningful way. Um, if you need any special accommodations um, in order to have the best experience here at Midwest Design Week, um, please don't hesitate to reach out um, to one of our um, organizing team members um, on Slack, and we will do our best to provide you with whatever you need um, so that you, you know, to ensure that you're having a great experience. So, um, but with that being said, I'm ready uh, to go ahead and get started, and I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Sadie Redwing. Uh, Sadie Redwing is a Lakota graphic designer and advocate from the Spirit Lake Nation of Fort Fountain, North Dakota. Redwing earned her BFA in New Media Arts and Interactive Design at the Institute of American Indian Arts. She received her Master's of Graphic Design from North Carolina State University and her research on cultural revitalization through design tools and strategies created a new demand for tribal competence in graphic design research. Red Wing urges Native American graphic designers to express visual sovereignty in their design work, as well as encourage academia to include an indigenous perspective in the design curriculum. Now, with all of that out of the way, um, we're we'll heading and hand things over to Sadie. Um, go ahead, feel free to uh, share your screen. Absolutely. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I am super excited to share. And I just want to say happy belated Indigenous Peoples Day for those who celebrated on Monday. So I'm happy to uh, follow up following that holiday. So hopefully you can share my screen. If anything goes wrong, feel free to um, you know chime in and interrupt. But I don't want to waste any time. I want to go ahead and get started. So I just want to welcome everybody from the AIGA Midwest. My name is Sadie Redwing. I am, and I'll show a little bit of uh, where I'm from here. I am currently sitting in Central South Dakota, but I am enrolled citizen. So my citizenship is within the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation. And if you can see my cursor, it's that little tiny square up in North Dakota, but you may uh, hear myself reference myself as Lakota. I grew up within Central South Dakota along the Cheyenne River Lakota Nation. That is where uh, I am born and raised by my grandmother. And so sometimes you'll hear me say Dakota, Lakota, we're talking about North and South Dakota. So a lot of Dakotas, but just to know that I am from um, the uh, central South Dakota within the Great Plains area. So if you can kind of see, again, this map right here isn't necessarily accurate, but just to kind of know that my representation and perspective is gonna be within the plains. So really within the grasslands or traditional prairie. And honestly, this, uh, map is a little bit inaccurate. Um, this is post colonization, because I've always heard stories that us uh, Plains tribes, we would follow the buffalo from Canada all the way to the Carolinas, but it wasn't until more that uh, colonization kind of destructing, um, kind of destroyed a lot of our prairie to the point where now we're on these little reservations. But I um, am very happy to uh, you know, work within the Native American demographic. I am currently a student success coach with the American Indian College Fund. So my work right now, uh, or my position doesn't categorize me as a designer. I am more of an advocate specifically for the indigenous demographic who uh, need the resources in order to feel included and safe and comfortable working within higher education spaces. So you might hear me in two conversations within design research and also advocating for a Native American student experience at a mainstream Western college. So one of the reasons why I'm on both of these paths is one, we need greater curriculum in more uh, assignments built within the graphic design program that speaks to indigenous populations, but also too, there is a strong urgency of the lack of retention to hold Native American and indigenous students into art and design spaces. So I really, uh, really am passionate about learning how to create resources so that we can keep Native American uh, students in their seats, specifically at art and design schools. So. 
uh, you will notice that a little bit of my work here and in, in speaking around what that looks like and in introducing indigeneity and sovereignty into a classroom space. But before I kind of get into some of that work, I do want to share a little bit of my journey. I've been fortunate pre-COVID to have traveled across the globe the past four years. And I've shared this uh, presentation called Fuck the Stereotype. And what I really share during that presentation is there's such a dependency or there was a dependency of stereotypes when targeting the Native American demographic, but there's a lot of these sovereign tribes that are pushing for sovereignty, and that includes the practice of decolonization. That also includes the practice of expressing a different narrative and identity away from the stereotypes. So we're kind of, so what has been interesting in the past year or so that we've been progressing far from that stereotype. There's been a lot of uh, 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 social or uh, I guess a lot of meat or how do you want to say it? events in the news that have happened in the past year or so that has progressed this uh, uh, the going away of being reliant and dominant on that stereotype. So but before I but before I kind of get into that progression, I do want to share how uh, how we kind of work into that space to talk about these terms around sovereignty, visual sovereignty and decolonization. And one of the one things that I'm pulling from that fuck the stereotype presentation is how the search results within our search or so for example, if I have a student who is looking for inspiration on an assignment that they want to include some Native American visual language into that piece, well, where do they look and where do they go to and what results come from these searches in uh, when you go on Google, you'll notice that well, I should say my Google results in uh, have a uh, maybe a little bit different than yours, but just to know on an average Google results when you uh, Google Native American graphic design, indigenous graphic design, uh, there is an extreme lack of actual <laughs> Native American graphic designers in their search results. And the same goes with these other search engines too. So I know I have a lot of students that utilize Behance and view another uh, other artists' portfolios. So I'd have my students do a practice and say that when you get onto your search engines, put in these keywords like Native American, Indigenous, American Indian, and see what you find. And what you find too is we're still, there's still a large dominance of a non-Indigenous artist into these spaces. And I'm just gonna share, I'll give it a couple of examples, but just to understand there is I would, I'm gonna say harm when it comes to the lack of indigenous artists into these spaces. And part of that is um, I, there is a demographic that is still very, uh, um, I, well, how would you say, still very vulnerable in the sense of uh, acquiring what is authentic Native American visual language. So um, for these next <laughs> few slides here, I, um, I just kind of want to show what kind of comes up in these results specific to Native America in the, in the continent of um, North America. So if a student is seeing this image, it's an artist from France, and what images are they predicting when it comes to Native Americans? Now, uh, I'm not for sure how, uh, if this, uh, uh, artist or designer from France is familiar with Native American culture, or maybe too, maybe this is speaking to the indigenous people of France, I'm not for sure. But if this search result is coming up when you're speaking to specifically America, it's not really helpful for my student that is looking for greater research resources. So in means of, I would ask my student, does this speak to you? Does this represent you? Does this give pride in who you are as a Native American? And I, and again, not necessarily a right or wrong answer, but to give the student a chance to really allow, um, you know, if they, if they relate and have connection to these images. Uh, another area that we talk about in, sim in the same assignment is, uh, you know, what is this speaking to? Now, we one thing that is obvious that the, the aesthetics and the actual artwork of these images are nice. So meaning that the details in the plumes and the feathers, the detail in the hair, the detail in the clothes is really beautiful. It's really gorgeous work. But again, what is the visual speaking to the identity? And is it relating to us? Is it harmful to us? And also too, we're getting a lot of artists coming from France <laughs> that are really, um, you know, really depicting this image that we uh, have 
uh, connection to here in the United States. And also to another conversation that kind of comes out of this is, you know, when my students are making animation characters and they're making a portfolio of specific, you know, fictional characters, their portfolios aren't necessarily dominant in a French person or someone of a European descent. So just kind of really trying to put this, this type of artwork into perspective and just say, look, you're creating these wonderful pieces, but what is it targeting? Who is it targeting? How is it harming the targeted, the non-targeted audience when they really in a desperate need of more resources for their uh, graphic design projects? And lastly, it's another example that the aesthetics are really beautiful when it comes to the color choices and you know how the individual is drawn. But but again, what is being communicated in this visual piece? I get a little bit annoyed sometimes that we still. Uh, the Native American, how would you say, I guess religion or spiritual beliefs are always associated with psychedelics. I don't get it. Like, let's move on from this. I'm tired of seeing these posters at Spencer's or Hot Topic or in the, in the black light. but it'd just be nice that there's a little bit more protocoling in our identities, what is being shared in these results. So again, if anybody has the time and is really interested in this practice, go ahead and go on some of your search results or your search engines and type in Native American graphic design and see what you see and ask if that's even helpful for you or your students. If not, then that's just a acknowledgement that we need to build more resources so that there are more Native American designers that pop up in at least the first three pages in some of these search results. So having that said, I really want to stress the importance of having, of actually showing identity in any time I have a classroom or workshop or I'm interacting within a space where we might be, you know, making something, I remind that, that group or that space or that classroom, how powerful we are as graphic designers, especially when we are utilizing someone's language and we're utilizing someone's identity. So to really understand that that power is really strong. Like we allow somebody to see their language. And that is really one of the most powerful, uh, quotes that somebody that one of my mentors said to me is like Sadie when you're in graphic design and you're working with visual languages and symbolism you have the power to allow someone to see their language and you also have the power to take away that language and the same with identity so um, I really I really stress that in my space of how uh, serious this this is we, we're not really we don't really necessarily have the artistic freedom when we're designing specifically visual communications that are speaking to a nationality. So what, uh, what terminology that kind of speaks to designing for sovereign nations is this term visual sovereignty, or as I define as how do you design for a tribe's nationality? So to give an example, uh, there are many uh, sovereign nations out there in the United States and what as a sovereign nation, we are almost a little mini country in the United States, which means that we do have opportunities to go speak with the United Nations as a specific nation, but you don't really see a lot of tribal nations and other global events. So for example, the Olympics. So thinking about, okay, um, if Sadie were to go to the Olympics, let's just say I'm gonna be a gymnast, let's say I'm, I'm a gymnast in the Olympics, I would be coming in as a representative of the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation. So that means I would be entering in the parade of flags, not with the United States flag and not with a singlet or uniform or, you know, warm up outfits and red, white, and blue and stars. I would actually be in a uniform that speaks to my nation, the Spirit Lake Dakota Nation. So if you remember my flag on my title screen, that light blue, you know, but we, uh, haven't had opportunity to be in a space like this to demonstrate what those uniforms would look like, but someone would need to design them, right? And who's going to design them? Other than the Olympics, think about, you know, the, let's say something like the FIFA World Cup, you know, what if the Lakota Nation or the Navajo Nation or the Cherokee Nation or Seminole Nation or the Mohawk Nation, what if one of these tribal nations wanted to enter into enter a, a soccer football team into the FIFA World Cup? Again, what would their jerseys look like? You know, what, uh, how would fans be representing them in the crowd, we would not be entering into these spaces 
with the United States of America uh, dormant. So kind of give an idea on where this concept of visual sovereignty is, is demonstrating a nationality. And when we're here, specifically the United States, not even talking about Canada and not even talking about our relatives in Mexico who have no federal recognition, but here in the United States there are over, five, and this uh, number is inaccurate. So there are over 580 federally recognized tribes. So being a graphic designer and knowing that there's a large stress and there's a lack of graphic designers to, to design for 580 tribes. One Lakota designer cannot design for 580 plus languages and identities. So this is the importance of really wanting to bring a lot of this into curriculum. And I'm showing this slide here for anybody who wants to kind of learn more about sovereign nations or a resource where you can go to bia.gov and I like how it splits it up into region because we really uh, categorize our visual languages based on region or resources that come from these specific areas of land and then just also to one of the reasons why the number is kind of limbo sometimes is because there's more and more tribes wanting sovereign recognition within from the U.S. government and also to their tribes are losing members and are going extinct so uh, this number of, um, I would just say 580 plus, because it's always, uh, it always is in limbo sometimes. So just to be mindful of that. And knowing that there are all those nations, we only have 35 tribal colleges. And the sad part is that none of these tribal colleges offer a bachelor's or higher in graphic design. You may participate in an art curriculum that might allow you to learn Adobe programs, might get a certificate in web design building, but just to know that, the, again, when we talk about equity and we talk about the lack of resources on uh, getting Native American students proper education and design and art research, the, we don't have the infrastructure yet. And it'd be nice to live in a country where we have 580 plus tribal colleges, but we don't have that yet. But just to give an idea and show you uh, what tribal colleges that we have. And also too, a lot of these tribal colleges do provide curriculum and resources for other terminology that, is, that I notice is being shared within the design community, like decolonization, decolonialism. So if anybody is looking for more resources on how to utilize those terminologies into curriculum, reach out to a tribal college. They got indigenous professors, you know, they got, uh, you know, they, all the aspects and motives to actually practice this word decolonization is there at those tribal colleges. And I always have to do, uh, give a definition of how I define these because I'm coming from an experience that um, I'm actually being affected by colonization now. So decolonization, we're talking about ownership of land. So here in the United States, who are the two parties that are constantly at war when it comes to land here in the United States. It's the US government and it's a tribal nation. So for myself, I'm a generational landowner that has, has land that has not been owned by the US government, but I do have the state of North Dakota and the state of South Dakota still wanting to buy that land. I still got farmers and ranchers kind of destruct that land. So just even thinking about this actual, con this actual practice and demonstration of how do we show land rights and how do we show that there is a nation that owns that land so that the larger dominant um, demographic in the United States doesn't, uh, you know, just destroy us completely. So really thinking about the ownership of land and where the United or where um, tribal nations uh, are demonstrating that act of decolonization is obtaining and wanting to demonstrate where the land rights versus decolonialism where we're looking at more policy, more rules, more frameworks, more, um, I guess, guidelines, you can say rules. And for example, instead of actual land ownership, you know, an example I would see of colonialism is how something like the Bible has constructed the culture of the United States. You know, that Bible has introduced, you know, gender roles or just different beliefs, but not necessarily talking about ownership of land. So really thinking about policy, policy versus own, uh, land, physical land ownership. So some of these, these next screen caps are a bit outdated, but again, it's been a weird year. I feel like time has been really awkward. So yes, this was last July, but I feel like it was just yesterday. But one win for U.S. tribes, specifically in Oklahoma, is that the eastern half of the state of Oklahoma 
recognize those tribes' uh, sovereign rights. So meaning that anything that happens in these territories within the Cherokee Nation, Muscogee Nation, Choctaw Nation, Chickasaw Nation, Seminole Nation, anything that happens, so thinking about if there was a murder on murder or um, you know some type of crime that was committed on these land territories, the tribal nations need to be present in knowing how to, I guess, uh, conduct a resolution of whatever incident may have happened. So, um, which is a huge that they're being recognized at that federal level. And if one thing that is important to know is that more and more tribes are wanting to push for sovereignty. And if more and more tribal nations are brought to the table, think about, you know, if you're working at an institution, so if you are, sorry, if you're working at a university, and they're bringing more liaisonship amongst the tribe uh, that your university sits on, you're going to need to be familiar with that tribe's policies and that tribe's culture. So slowly we're snowballing, and I know they're starting of land acknowledgments, but again, there needs to be greater liaisonship and relationship building in between businesses and universities that are seated on tribal territories. And one of the most uh, one of the most, uh, ter or how would you say, one of the most demanding aspects of wanting to get these land rights recognized is seen in our fight, the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota's fight for the Black Hills. So within the treaty, the 1868 treaty, it outlines specific uh, land, which I'll show in this uh, in this map here. So within that treaty, this shows that all of this is land of the Ochete Shakoin or the Lakota Dakota Nakota. And if you see, or if you know what is present in the center of this land is a very tourist trap called Mount Rushmore. But just to know that something like Mount Rushmore is in our Black Hills, it's in our ceded territory. And anybody who is in the White House is not gonna wanna turn over Mount Rushmore to us but also they are fighting to buy the Black Hills from us. So for if, if a solution of wanting to solve this problem of not wanting those Black Hills to be sold, we need to demonstrate ourselves as a nation. Well, how are we doing that? And how are we doing that visually? How do people know that when you cross in the uh, Western half of Missouri River that you are in Lakota territory? So again, how can a graphic designer show that nationality? So the importance of, of needing this work and another importance, and this is a little bit off topic from designing from nationality, but also when we talk about indigenous perspective and design models and design infrastructures. And we, when we talk about this word reciprocity. So I don't have the time to show this uh, documentary on Netflix. I hope it's still on Netflix. It's been a minute since I checked, but if you get on Netflix, there's this uh, documentary called Kiss the Ground. And Kiss the Ground really talks about how uh, the demand for, I guess, U.S. crops and um, beef is really overworking our soil. And we know that. And one of the ways and one of the practices of decolonization is uh, regeneration are revitalizing uh, land. And for myself, it'd be the prairie and just knowing that the importance of the buffalo. Like I said, we followed the buffalo from Canada all the way to North Carolina. And then that buffalo migration pattern, the feet of the buffalo work that soil perfectly. So we didn't overwork, overtill the soil with the buffalo and it kept that prairie alive and it kept that grass long. And that grass uh, that tall grass cleans the air just like trees. So when we get into talk about climate change and we get to talk about bringing more indigenous perspective or design research into spaces, this is another example of what decolonization is, what sovereignty uh, methods of how to uh, protect the prairie is, and also to how we can bring some more of the indigeneity into spaces that need it. So there's a huge, huge need for climate change. And one of the reasons why it's so hard to demonstrate that, and I apologize, there's a trigger warnings in here, um, is that we're always at confrontation. <laughs> we're always at confrontation with the Army Corps engineers, with the government, with state, you know, state legislature, who you name it, like it's really hard um, or it's really annoying in some sense that we just want to, you know, keep our grass long, or we want to keep our prairie alive, our animals alive, our clean water, but man, just the government just won't leave us alone. <laughs> they won't, I don't know, there's not, not much trust in, in allowing us to really revitalize this land. So hence another need to demonstrate what our nationality is so that we can really be of aid in um, 
in I guess the saving of this planet in some sense but I just wanted to show because as we kind of um, as you kind of get an understanding the importance of this as a nation we I mean, kind of funnel the importance down into let's say a space within higher education within I within where I work so like I said more and more tribes or more and more states are uh, turning over land rights to tribes, which is beautiful. Again, it's a domino effect. It's not the snowball is rolling, but it's not as big as it should be. And just to know that more and more um, regions, we're seeing it on the West Coast, hopefully more here in the Midwest. But if you can just kind of get a sense that, uh, you know, there there is progression and there is movement. And again, if you work in a business or university that is going to um, be seated on tribal territory, you know, you, hopefully you're understanding the importance of why there needs to be a land acknowledgement and why you need to be familiar with that culture, especially if that liaisonship is brought at a um, at a higher level. So um, in in when so kind of give an example of when that is brought into let's say university. So like I said, I work um, as an advocate for Native American students and also really focus my design practices within uh, institutions and universities that want to create a more inclusive space for Native American students. And um, one example that I share here to kind of see what progression is, is, um, you know, example like University of Illinois. University of Illinois had a uh, chief, I want to say Chief Illinois, but had a chief that was more, or had a mascot that uh, had an individual that looked like a Native American chief with the headdress and with the, um, I guess with the individual who would be at the football games or whatever it may be, but just to know that 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 mascot was harmful to us. And it's just nice to know that Illinois is looking to put an Im uh, imagery in implementation plan to move away from the, the dependency on that racist mascot. Now, if they aren't depending on a racist mascot anymore, what are they going to do? What, you know, what imagery are they going to use? Who's, who's in their design department that is going to allow them to um, speak to their Native American students? And part of, uh, part of speaking or targeting the Native American demographic on that campus, you got to include all areas or all aspects of culture, one being language. And I'm showing this example for the Wheezy Palm program. So I'm here at, uh, in South Dakota and the University of South Dakota and South Dakota State have programs with the Crazy Horse Memorial and Black Hills. And within those programs, they are, those programs are for Native American students and preparing them to uh, go to a mainstream or westernized university and to design a more inclusive space or environment for these students specifically it'd be nice to have opportunity to show them Lakota language or Dakota language and this is so unfortunate that this program or this uh this uh, this design project fell through and it fell through because South Dakota State uh did not two comments that came out from these, and I'm just gonna leave it at these two comments. One, our language is intimidating. And two, uh, a lot of people don't have keyboards or know how to do the keyboard commands for specific characteristics. And to know that your language is too intimidating just yet is so infuriating, but it also makes you know your design thinking or you as a designer to explore more well how can I make my language less intimidating and again that's not my problem you know that's not my problem to be solving but again it makes me bring the question up how do we know other languages in the United States you know why in high school was I told to take German or Spanish or French why wasn't I allowed to take Lakota or Dakota or Cheyenne or Arapaho when it's just right there. Why would I, you know, why would I go to France to learn Lakota? So kind of really even too, if we're struggling to bring our language into these spaces, that's a problem. And how do we do that more? And just to even some other beautiful aspects and revitalizing culture with this project is thinking about our color palettes. The prairie has such beautiful flowers and um, fruits and dirts and different dyes that we now have something like Illustrator or the Adobe Suite where we can bring some of these traditional colors and boost the saturation up, you know, give them another life, but then also too, it's another remembrance of, oh yeah, this flower, um, 
you know, the, uh, the flowers in the prairie are this type of purple, or yeah, we do have this type of face paint that comes from, you know, this maroon color or whatnot. So again, this, you know, it'd, it'd be nice to really have an opportunity to share some of these, you know, traditional color palettes that were created pre-contact for the students that need it the most, the students that need their culture, you know, revitalized because it's on the verge of extinction. So just to kind of give an example of, you know, what that would look like if we're doing either a logo or how do you incorporate some other um, cultural elements into a space. Now, for this one, again, back on <laughs> back on language, but I just wanted to make note on this too, is that um, at the American Indian College Fund, we know to not translate a scholarship. So if a tribe gives us a large donation and that scholarship donation is in a tribal language, we leave it at that tribal language. Uh, for this one, uh, the Ina Na Wong Sape scholarship for the single mothers, if I, so I work as a student success coach, if I'm getting a student, a list of scholarships, and if a student is unable to translate this or doesn't know what it is, they're probably not going to apply to it. So how do you how can you give some identity or visual communication of what this uh, scholarship is if a student can't translate it? So hence, well, what does a single mother look like? What does a Native American mother look like? How do you put a Native American individual onto a, a, a a design or uh, onto an art space without giving them feathers or without being stereotypical. So as I'm going to share in these last few examples, um, which I hope helps for some other, some other people's branding, especially think about Indigenous Peoples Day next year, you want to put in some characters or individuals that look Native American, but aren't, um, aren't using like feathers or stereotypes, you know, what are some cues or what are some, some things that you can do? And I know working with the students specifically on this project of the Our Voices at UC Riverside in uh, California, their Indian Health Services program had a podcast and that podcast was for intended for physicians or nurses or anyone in that medical or health field that are non-native or non-indigenous and they work specifically with indigenous patients. Now there is a lack of cultural competency there um, in that work. So that podcast was a resource to help um, you know, those, those professionals work respectfully within their patients. Now to give some imagery to those podcast covers, working with the students groups, I'd ask them, well, how do we show, how do we show a Native American individual? And one of the main things, one of the most beautiful things that came out of that workshop was adornment, jewelry. You know, we have such great fashion and it's always appropriated. Like let's let's show what we're wearing in, you know, in, in modern times. And we show like what, you know, what jewelry is unique to us and what different tribes show that or wear the specific shells or bones or beads or leather or whatever it may be. So, so for the, um, for the woman individual here with her earrings, now the individual in the purple, this individual might seem a little bit androgynous, but just to know that there are Native American men that do work in health and do work as physicians and doctors and nurses. So how do you represent them? And how do you represent a Native American male if they are an individual long hair? And how do you represent them if they uh, may not, and I'm saying this respectfully, <laughs> they may not have uh, the genetics to grow a beard <laughs> or to grow a mustache. So just to know that they need representation too, and to really uh, push that their identity is just as important, even if they, uh, even if they're in, even if they don't meet the stereotypical masculine image within the United States. So, um, and then lastly, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, this is a, a piece that I made within the college fund. And I made this piece with this one idea in mind. I had an elder tell me again, the power of being a graphic designer that um, we as artists and designers and photographers or you name it, who are working with the Native Americans, we need to document what a Native American looks like in 20, 2020, 2021, 2022, you name it, 2015, because a hundred years down the road when uh, a student is wanting to know what Native Americans were like in the 2000s, and we're still, and if we're still relying on imagery from the 1800s, they're gonna 
think that <laughs> we haven't changed since the 1800s. So how, how can we document um, our identity now? And just knowing that this piece was created during COVID time and the importance of a Native American student, um, but, you know, beating, you know, the odds and what do they look like in a higher education space? They're gonna have a mask, they're gonna be wearing their jewelry. And this individual here in this piece is in front of the world. And in the world is, uh, if you can see, there's uh, florals branching out of the world, which is kind of speaking to our flourishment and our blooming and that we're bringing that knowledge and perspective and identity and sovereign and demonstrating decolonization into these higher education spaces. And uh, there needs to be more resources for them. They need to be included, which includes, you know, these these communications and these visuals and to know that we need more educated Native American graphic designers to do so because we are becoming more and more included into space. Our sovereignty is being recognized. And um, again, we're still in a flourishing movement. So I'm gonna end there. And I just wanna thank everybody for uh, allowing me to have the space to share. And yeah, feel free, there's my, uh, I'm mostly active on Instagram, my website's there, but feel free to reach out and send me an email, sadieredwing at gmail.com. And specifically, if you have students, you have Native American students who are looking for resources, please have them connect with me. So I'm gonna leave that at that and I'm gonna come back to the Zoom screen. So again, thank you, AIGA Midwest. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sadie. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much for um, for going over all of that and giving us um, hopefully some new things we hadn't maybe learned before. Um, we do have a couple of questions that we're gonna kind of start with. Um, so um, what are some resources that we can utilize to ensure that we are not doing harm to any indigenous peoples and making sure that we are representing them in ways that are not harmful? Yeah, I would say first, depending on where you're at in the Midwest, um, see if there's any um, resources that speak to the tribes in your nation. So, um, for example, if, uh, you know, depending on where you work on their website, is there any type of land acknowledgement? If not, is someone going to ask why not? Or maybe even too, if there's um, opportunity to really... Uh, ask questions on how you can get more information on the tribe that you're next to. Uh, so either that might be in a museum, either that might be in a cultural center, if you're in an urban, urban space, um, but they're out there. And if, if you're struggling to find those resources that might be within your own city or within your own community, I would suggest to reach out to a tribal college that might be in vicinity. So vicinity might be mean, 100 miles, 500 miles, <laughs> but if you get a chance to, you know, just Google tribal college and, you know, reach out to a tribal college and I guarantee there's wonderful resources there. If not, I would suggest if you are somebody who's, um, you know, looks for more resources within social media, check the hashtags, hashtag land back, hashtag decolonization, hashtag, uh, I know right now, Indigenous Peoples Day, there's gonna be all kinds of work in those hashtags. So it's unfortunate that we don't, as a tri I'm speaking for our 500 plus tribal nations, we don't have um, a, a community like AIGA, meaning we don't have conferences. It's a little bit harder to get on and maybe look for specific Native American graphic designers. But if you can, um, you know, if you have opportunity to go to either a museum, connect with a tribal college, or get on social media and check out some hashtags, or even just do some searching on um, hashtags. And just now, you know, Indigenous people would say it was, it was just Monday. So I guarantee there's still some light, you know, some, some, uh, pretty frequent, or how would you say, just relevant events that might have been going on that could direct you. Sometimes you gotta go down that Instagram rabbit hole. And um, again, if there's anything specific, please reach out. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share, uh, it's not a question, but I wanted to share this comment with you. Um, Michael was saying in the chat, like love to think that all of these patterns and iconography um, was graphic design before we even thought to call it graphic design. Yeah, I, um, that's one thing that's a little bit challenging too, is that when we, we live, so being an educator, being within, um, you know, being indigenous and knowing that I'm coming into a space with a, 
with a very long history <laughs> and, um, and to know that something like English or something like the alphabet, it's still pretty contemporary, specifically when we talk about Midwest, like colonization didn't hit here until like the late 1700s. So if you're out on the East Coast, you got hit with it, you know, in the 1400s, but it still was 200 years until Custer made its way, his way to, let's say, South Dakota. And just to kind of be mindful that, you know, they, um, they weren't in Lamborghinis, so it doesn't mean they're here overnight. So we still had that time to preserve our, our um, culture a little bit, but part of that uh, cultural preservation allowed us to document with visuals. So if we didn't communicate English, we didn't write in English, how are we documenting stuff? And how are mm -hmm. we writing stuff? How are we remembering stuff? Like if I, it's not like I could, um, you know, get out a notepad and write my grocery list down, like how, how would I, what, what type of cue would I give myself to remind me of what I need to do, what my prayer may be, you know, what my family history may be, what event happened at war, you know, how do you, you know, if we're going to, if we're um, following the Buffalo and we're going down or when we interacting in the trade routes, you know, how do I, how do I remember um, all these significant events? And they usually come from either symbols. And they usually come from, um, you know, I always see the use of the Ojibwe dream catcher with beads on it, you know, something like how a bead is acts as a, uh, um, as a, as a memory cue. So if I look at this bead, a specific color it reminds me of that specific event. So kind of same thing with our painting, same thing with our symbols. So um, just to kind of really uh, show that in a respectful way where that patterns or those visual languages aren't ending up on anything inappropriate. It's just kind of the reminders like, yeah, like if we didn't have A, B, C, D, how were we, um, you know, documenting a lot of this, a uh, lot of important information that needs to be shared. So that kind of comes within those semiotics of why we, um, why we remember something based on a, an icon or a symbol or index or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got a question here from Sarah asking, um, do you ever involve the native tribes in your creative process for your projects? I do. And it depends on the region too. So it depends on what is being created. So if I am making something that is going to speak to all the Lakota nation, I have to make sure that an elder is present. I have to make sure that, uh, you know, if I am speaking in Lakota, it's going to be written correctly. It's, you know, it's going to, everything is going to be useful and, uh, and, and appropriate to be shared. Uh, not every single project I'm reaching out to Spirit Lake Nation or not every single project I'm reaching out to the Cheyenne River Nation, um, but just to know that uh, this is why it's important to have curriculum and to have somebody educated in a sense so that when, whatever they communicate is trusted. Um, I, as a graphic designer, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't stress somebody to be like writing letters or trying to contact a tribal government just to do like a homework assignment or a project. But if you are actually designing something for the sovereign nation, definitely reach out to the tribal government. But if you are designing something for, let's say, if I'm just designing Indigenous Peoples Day graphic for, you know, my Lakota friends, like I'm not necessarily, I don't need tribal approval. And again, um, it, depending on what, you know, what you're, you're making, you know, the importance or significance of it, um, you know, just, 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 just be mindful on, um, you know, what's, uh, I guess just don't be pulling something out of thin air. Like there has to be some type of uh, direction and an um, appropriate messaging when utilizing uh, tribal visual languages. And I, and even mm -hmm. to maybe that question was asking if, you know, I don't, I, I'm not comfortable working in other tribal visual languages. For example, like I, um, if someone was asking me to do something that's targeting the Navajo nation, I would probably reach out or pass a project to a Navajo designer, or even, or if I am asked, or if I'm invited to work, for example, working with um, University of Wisconsin, Madison, that is predominantly Ho-Chunk in Anishinaabe territory. And I had professors of those descents present to help 
uh, protocol, my choices. So, um, just, I mean, just again, the, I know it's really hard to find resources on specific tribes and, and visual languages, but I suggest if you can't find the designer, find that professor. <laughs> mm -hmm. On a similar kind of note to that, and you might have, uh, I think you kind of covered some of this um, in a previous question, but, you know, representation of BIPOC, you know, designers, um, and design work can be often slim to none when you're in design school. I know it was pretty uh, not not a thing uh, whenever I was uh, in design school. It was uh, a, lot, a lot of white guys were covering you know, all of the, <laughs> the different design work in. So um, what recommendations do you have for educators um, who are wanting to include um, indigenous, indigenous perspective or education um, in their design curriculum? Yeah, um, this is actually a really great question, and um, I'm I might throw a hundred ideas out there, but just to <laughs> uh, just to kind of just to help paint the picture a little bit, one one area of myself that I find myself in as an educator is I realize that there's still a large population that has no idea <laughs> what like indigenous culture is, and that blows my mind because I have to remind myself that you know I'm immersed in my own community. So, you know, thinking about, you know, the bubble that I'm in, you know, my conversations at the kitchen table and my home are completely different than uh, the conversations being had in a non-Indigenous home. So I really have to remind myself and be patient that, okay, I really have to paint the picture. And that's like been my key word, like this past uh, couple years on how do I paint the picture on what an ideal world would look like for myself. So for example, designers, they're inventors. Designers, we invent and we visually give identity to those inventions and we share and we, you know, we design think, we create systems and, and all that. And if I feel like, you know, for example, let's say that um, I, I know what the journey was as a student, as a Native American student at a non-tribal college. I knew what it felt like when I would walk into a classroom and I was the first Native that someone's ever seen before and there's just no uh, competency or there was just no, um, it, it was just hard to have, it's just hard to have a response. So I really had to practice, okay, you have all these things, I want them too. Um, but I can't do it alone. Hence, this is me wanting to be a teacher so I can help, you know, help get future designers educated so they can start painting a picture of a future world would look like. So if, you know, if I, um, sorry, this is going to be a little bit of a long no, it's answer, okay. but it's okay. We've um, got time. <laughs> um, so let's say that, you know, if I just wanted to make my students journey comfortable, like meaning that I want, you know, I want to feel like everyone else. And if, you know, let's say that we got finals, we got midterms or sitting in a classroom, I see all my classmates and they all got Red Bulls and they all got different flavors of Red Bulls. I was like, man, like I want to, I want a flavor of a Red Bull that comes from the prairie. So let's say the choke cherry, the choke cherry is a fruit from the prairie. And I was like, man, like it would be nice. I'm trying to get these finals done. I want to have a choke cherry Red Bull. Why don't I have that yet? So even how would I bring that to life, you know, and who would, who would brand that? So um, that was just one little example. A second thing is, okay, you know, I got my Red Bull, you know, maybe I'm hungry. I want to take a lunch break from my midterms and I want to go to an American fast food chain. Like I can go, let's say I went to North Carolina state food court. There's like Chick-fil-A, Taco Bell, uh, maybe Bojangles or something, but uh, you know, why, where's the Native American fast food chain? And um and, you know, really asking these questions that people don't really think about. So, you know, if, um, if someone said, well, you know, I don't know of one, you know, if there was one, could you name a meal off of it? Could you in picture what the architect of the building looked like? Who's going to design the menus and stuff like that? So now let's say that, uh, you know, what if, you know, again, same classroom, I got my Native American fast food meal, I got my Red Bull. Now, what if I wanted Alexa? So let's say that, you know, we're playing music to kind of get to get our assignments done. But I want to Alexa and I want to speak to Alexa and Lakota. So who? So I'm so all right, I'm gonna contact Amazon, Amazon, let's get some tribal languages spoke with those Alexas. Well, who's gonna speak them? And stuff like that. So, um, and I hope this is kind of 
this is might be a little bit of a, a far-fetched example of what to answer this question, but my main point is that when it comes to painting a picture, we really have to envision what a future looks like for a Native American student. A Native American student can get a graphic design degree and um, you know have their portfolio, go work at a firm, work for IBM, or go work at you know tech or whatever it may be, wherever they would see them to be. But if they can't envision a future for themselves and to be included. And if no one is giving those examples, um, then they're going to be lost. And I know there's a lot of ambition, and there is, um, you know, there specifically in my generation to go get educated and come back to the community and help, you know, demonstrate sovereignty. Well, we do need Native American students educated in future trends. So, other than Alexa, how's AI going to help their tribal communities? Uh, what if they're in a community where, you know, we don't have electricity, um, we don't have 5G where I'm at right now, <laughs> like, we're so, but to, and just even think about how this pandemic has really made us rely on like Uber, or like, I'm gonna say like Uber Eats or, you know, Amazon delivery, well, what if we don't have uh, addresses on our, on our reservations, so um, to, for this long-winded answer to kind of um, share that, you know, the more that you can help paint that picture and to help include and you don't have to understand the culture just really think about well you know what what would help you be a good student other than food <laughs> and other than alexa like you know what about a calendar how you want to get your homework assignments done you know there's all these traditional Na uh, native american calendars you know even if you don't know how to make one you can encourage that student to go um, learn but i would wrap up and say you know help paint that picture and if you don't know what that picture looks like, really start to think about, well, how do I know about other, other nationalities? How do I know about other things? Even as something as simple, like everything, this desk comes from Ikea. What if I want a desk made by a Native American furniture store? You know, who's going to spark that idea and who's going to allow that? What if I wanted to buy a laptop? What if I want to go to my reservation, go to, I don't know, like a Native, like Native American Best Buy, and I wanted to make laptops built by Native Americans. Like, why is that such a far-fetched idea? So again, these, because these ideas aren't communicated probably as often in, in your general conversations, the more you can, you know, try to build what a future would look like for a Native American student, the more they're going to excel. And it's okay if you don't know the language, it's okay if you don't know the culture, you just got to really be positive and just be like, all right, well, I don't know any resources. I can't help you. <laughs> like, that, like, you know, just got to really, um, you know, just lay the, just lay the foundation there. And I guarantee that um, those students will, will go. So um, yeah, I, I always ask myself, like, you know, how, how do I know so much about like pho or sushi? Or how do I know so much about like anime characters? Like, what if we use these same, if we had these same awareness and exposures, of um, indigeneity and these spaces are created by designers are invented by designers you know how much more we know about native americans so we wouldn't have to be in this position so um just really think about you know you know other than international you know why don't tribes do this this and this but don't like downplay them like we're getting there like well, i know i know we might seem a little bit rural and poor at the moment but just to know that we're so strong and we're so thriving and um, you know, the hardest part that other demographics don't face in here is that we're constantly battling the U.S. government and it's exhausting. So it's just like we want to be in these conversations around technology, but also at the same time, I'm tired of, um, you know, just tired of the stress on like the destruction of my own homeland. Like I can't even focus on this research when I, you know, when the Army Corps engineers are just, you know, at the fence posts. So. <laughs> Okay, let me see if we can get through a couple more questions. So thank you for that response. I think that was really helpful. Um, there's a question asking, is the BIA.gov the best re uh, resource to reach the nations that may be present in my area or are there other sources to find that information? Yes, I would start there. I would start there as the least you can see a map. You can at least see um, area or you can see um, you know, depending on where you're searching within that region, you can see where offices are, you can kind of see where they're populated, you might even see some of them might be populated more close to a river or um, just to kind of get an idea of where they may be at, I would suggest to use that site. Um, if uh, another 
uh, area of conversation that we didn't get to in this presentation, but also it's going to be kind of coming into a larger conversation too, is relationship building between the BIA and the U.S. government. So um, in thinking about, like I said, the more and more these nations have their sovereign rights, there's going to be more liaisonship. And um, part of that liaisonship is it going to include a tribal government um, being brought into um, more of these infrastructure places. So um, if you are just looking for general, um, I guess, reservation names, sovereign nation names, who's closest to your area, um, there's, uh, oh, I'm, I'm blanking out on the link, but there's a link where you can uh, um, see what uh, land you're actually seated on <laughs> right now. Um, but I would suggest check out BIA. And again, if you, um, I know BIA has greater resources, but if um, like I, I'm, I'm so within the realm of higher education, just Google tribal colleges and just see what might be close. Cause I guarantee they probably work with universities. They probably work with the governments and states and agri or agricultural programs, health programs. Um, there's a lot of connections out there. And sometimes it's just hard to, um, you know just find a trusted resources when you're just, you know getting on Google and putting Native American nation. So BIA.gov for sure. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And if you ever think of that other link later, you can send it to me um, and I can, uh, we can share it out in the Slack channel too, for anyone who might be interested. Cool. And uh, let's see, we've got a comment and a question. Uh, the comment is, um, I grew up in the Western US um, and there's a lot stronger native presence there than it seems to be in the Midwest. That makes sense now with the time gap as colonization moved West. Yeah, um, I don't. <laughs> so yeah, the um, I'm not for sure who might be watching and how much they're familiar with, um, I guess, invasion or colonization, or mm -hmm. which direction it was coming and, 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 um, and whatnot. And I don't want to be too boastful and say that as you know the U.S. government or as colonization at the East Coast and got the U.S. government coming and as they're getting past the Mississippi River coming to the Missouri River, man, we put up a good fight to stop mm -hmm. them. And just meaning that um, there's a lot of pride in that. There's a lot of pride in being um, within the Midwest and being the tribes are the only tribes to this day that had defeated the U.S. government. Now. The, in the Western aspect, not saying that <laughs> if they did yeah. demolish us, that you know, their uh, the um, you know colonization might look a little bit different on the West, but also um, colonizers from the South and then up from um, I want to say the French or the British from the North and the Canada coming down to the United States, and also the uh, the Spanish coming up from the South. Um, you know, they, there, there is great influence on that West area, but I can't speak enough to the West to mm -hmm. really say what colonization looked like after, or who invaded what and what territory on the West. I just know that um, we put up a good fight to make sure that mm -hmm. <laughs> that colonization wouldn't go past, uh, I, I want, I'm going to say um, Wyoming, but uh, also too, there, I, um, it might be hard to find now, but I guess there is prominent, uh, trade route uh, aspect or prominent trade route points that could speak to that cultural reserve or preservation. So for example, mm -hmm. in New Mexico, down in the Southwest, they have tribes that have not moved. They have tribes that preserve stuff from, um, you know, since the dawn of their time. And to know that that still exists is so beautiful. And to know that other areas in the United States have the same thing, that they haven't been touched by um, the U.S. government or tainted in any way, or those resources haven't been exploited is, is beautiful. So in areas and aspects where those tribes have great preservation, that can speak to the sustainability of uh, the tribal nations in the West that um, still have uh, stronger, stronger um, ties to their culture, too. So... Um, we are technically out of, we're about out of time. I am going to break the rules and I'm going to sneak in one last one and then we'll, I'll do my closing. Um, there's a question asking, um, are there any Native American designers or artists that you can share that are representing the culture in a way that is breaking through barriers? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure, I would suggest to check out Ryan Redcorn. Ryan Redcorn um, has been a very influential gentleman in um, my, for myself as an inspiring graphic designer. I was familiar with him as he started in the 1491s um, comedic group. And just to know that he has uh, just a strong base for graphic design and to now that he's working with Reservation Dogs on Hulu, on FX is great. Ryan Redcorn, check him out for sure. Another influential mentor um, who's been in my journey, who um, has been in my journey is Greg Deal, G-R-E-G-G -G Deal, D-A-L, and um, a Paiute gentleman. And he has just been uh, in means of, you know, speaking up for yourself and taking pride in what, um, you know, what the things that you like and how you demonstrate uh, strength within your work. He has been very influential in that aspect. Uh, Neben Southall, N-E-E-B-I-N, Southall has the Native American Graphic Designers Project. So she, um, and I'll share this link with you, Ashton, is that mm -hmm. um, she has a long list of Native American graphic designers, and she's been a ground runner on collecting and finding these names, putting the, uh, finding their tribal affiliation and finding their websites and portfolios. So I'll be sure to sh uh, share that. But if anyone's typing on Google right now, Nebin, N-E-B-I-N, two E's, and um, you could put Native American uh, graphic design project, and there should be a catalog of of graphic designers there. And just, um, yeah, just there's, there's so, uh, with social media, man, there's so much um, coming up and then within here uh, specifically, or I guess some really good friends of mine too, who are doing some really wonderful work. We have Michael Clifford, AKA Wiko, W-I-T-K-O. Um, he is a musician, an artist. He owns, um, you know, he's a collector of Native American graphic design and he's sharing it in, uh, Rapid City, and he has his own food truck, so I'm very proud of him as well. Um, Derek No Sun, so N O space S U N, has War Medicine and just just wonderful apparel out in um, Shoshone. Um, oh, Derek, I know he's Shoshone from Idaho. He might be living in Santa Fe. Another resource too. Um, I you someone mentioned it about um, graphic design or using symbols was uh, graphic design before we actually called it graphic design. And to that point, there is a lot of graphic design work in the realm of art. So looking at painters, looking at uh, fashion designers, you know, looking at all these areas aspect that might have some marketing, branding, or even share that graphic design within their imagery. You know, Santa Fe, New Mexico is a great hub. And if you just get on this last August at the uh, Indian art market, Santa Fe Indian art market, and just uh, COVID just, I just wish COVID wasn't around because it's such a huge gathering of artists and designers. So um, that would be another area of research to look at just to just to kind of see names. And again, can't stress enough, get on those hashtags on social media and you'll find some wonderful um, uh, work. Hashtag land back, hashtag Indigenous Peoples Day. Hashtag, I don't want to go, I want to go through all the F, all the curse words, but it means of like to kill the black snake. There's so much movements going on in environmental justice and environmental justice will include Native American graphic designer work and it's out there. It's just a matter of um, really wanting to bridge and catalog into um, something that would be similar to AIGA specific for Native Americans. So keep, yeah, so it's, it's in the works for sure. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. We're, I was catching, kind of get all the names down and <laughs> stuff and everything. Um, but yeah, I did come across that uh, graphic designers like um, project, whatever that was, um, so she's like trying to pull everyone's information together. So um, very awesome that, you know, it just shows that, you know, someone out there just has to take initiative and like, and get it moving and, and everything like that. So, um, so that's all the time we've got for questions. We're already a little bit over, but I think that's okay. Um, thank you so much to everybody for joining us today. Let's give a virtual round of applause for Sadie Redwing. Um, and uh, before we leave, I wanna give another shout out to all of our sponsors uh, for this year's Midwest Design Week. Thank you so much um, for all of your support. Thanks everybody.